Welcome to the Media Library of First Baptist Church of Troy, Texas. We hope and pray you receive a blessing from today's message. First Baptist Church of Troy is a Christ-centered, family-friendly church which offers activities for kids, teens, and adults. You can learn more and contact us by visiting fbctroytx.org. Now, here's today's message. We're going to kind of start a little mini-series today. Uh, We're going to start looking at some of the stories in the Bible. Some of the stories in the Bible. And some of these are going to be very familiar Bible stories to you because some of you, since knee-high to the grasshopper, right, uh, you've grown up hearing these stories, whether it's in Sunday school, vacation Bible school, uh, uh, RAs, GAs, teen kid, whatever it may be, uh, or your mom and daddy told them to you. But as I talk to people, I'm finding out that more and more people do not know these stories because more and more people were not brought up in church. And you know, so if you're here today and you say, well, I didn't know this story, that's okay. That's all right. Get to know this story that we're going to look at today and the stories that we're going to be looking at in the next few, few weeks to come. And, and another problem I find with these stories is, is too many of us think that they are kids' stories. These are for children. These are children's stories. Yes, we taught them to our children, but folks, the stories we're going to look at are for children and adults, especially adults, because of the truths that we find in them. Uh, And so today we're going to start with one of my favorite stories. Can you guess which one it's going to be? I know, it's just, you just, while you're wondering what's going, yes, Daniel in the lion's den. Uh, No, that's not what we're going to do. Noah and the ark, Noah and the ark. To get in your Bibles, turn to Genesis chapter 6 and keep your Bibles open there. We're going to have some scripture up here on the screen, but we're going to be referring back to the Bible several times because there's just too much scripture to put up there uh, on some of the things that we have. So go ahead and find Genesis chapter 6. Again, we're going to start with Noah and the ark. I know a lot of folks say Noah's ark. I like to look at, think at Noah and the ark because it's really God's ark. He let Noah use it. And so that's kind of how I go at it here. And uh, many, uh, many folks know this story of Noah and the, and the ark that he built to save himself and his family from the great flood that, was, that God was going to, uh, to send. But uh, I think it's also safe to say that while a lot of people know this story, a lot of folks don't understand the meaning of the story. There's more than just a flood account and an ark full of animals. This story reveals for us several attributes of God, several of God's attributes. It gives us insight into who God is and how God works. And so our purpose today is going to be to bring out some of the attributes of God that we find in this story. Now, I'm not going to read this whole story because it goes for three chapters. Uh, I'm not going to read the whole thing. But, and so if you don't know the story, I encourage you to read Genesis 6 through 9 and get to know this story. And as you read it, hopefully what we've looked at today will cause you to understand this story a little bit better. Now, as we start into this story, from creation to where we're going to be at in this story today, is several generations have come and gone. But in the whole scheme of things, this story is not that far removed from creation, from Adam and Eve. It's not that far removed from them. So while we don't know exactly how far, and we don't know exactly when this event occurred, we know that this flood occurred historically because it's recorded for us as history in Scripture. Also, every ancient people group has a flood story. Every one of them do. Whether it's the Incas, the Mayas, the Egyptians, whomever it may be, every ancient people group has a flood story. That's not just a coincidence, folks. They have that story because there was a flood. There was a worldwide flood. 
And people who say, no, nah, I don't believe it, well, the Greek word for that is? There you go, hogwash. Uh, again, that ain't Greek, but it gets the point across. Um, and so, let's start off, we're going to read Genesis 6, verses 1 through 8. Genesis 6, verses 1 through 8. When mankind began to multiply on the earth, and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of mankind were beautiful, and they took any they chose as wives for themselves. And the Lord said, My spirit will not remain with mankind forever, because they are corrupt. Their days will be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth both in those days and afterwards when the sons of God came to the daughters of mankind who bore children to them, and they were the powerful men of old, the famous men. When the Lord saw that man's wickedness was widespread on the earth and that every scheme his mind uh, his mind thought of was nothing but evil all the time. The Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. Then the Lord said, I will wipe off from the face of the earth mankind whom I created, together with the animals, creatures that crawl, and the birds of the sky, for I regret that I made them. Noah, however, found favor in the sight of the Lord. Now, for me to say that there's a lot of interpretive difficulty in these first few verses uh, of this account, uh, it would be an understatement, to be quite honest with you. First of all, there's a lot of debate on who the sons of God are and what it means that they went and cohabitated with the daughters of men. And uh, since we're only going to spend one Sunday on Noah, I'm going to leave that for another time. We're not even going to touch on that, okay? And if you come up to me and go, well, what does that mean? Don't. Uh, no. <laughs> we, we can talk about it, but we're, that's not what this is all about. People will get caught on little minutia stuff. They'll get caught up on little bitty things. And, and Satan will use that to draw our attention away from some truths that we need to know from this story. Okay, And that's what we're going to look at. All I know is whatever happened, it was clear that God is not pleased with what's happening on planet Earth. He's not happy. And I do want to also take time to, here in just a second, address another difficulty that comes up in the text, because I think this part of the text shows us something important about God. In verse 6-3, it said this, And the Lord said, My spirit will not remain with mankind forever, because they are corrupt. Their days will be 120 years. Now that verse right there, there's some little bit of controversy in the verse of how to interpret it, but that verse right there reveals to us the first truth about God, and that is this. The account of Noah reveals God's patience with sinners. It reveals God's patience with sinners. Now, as I've read on these verses, I've looked at commentaries and saw what commentators have written, and I've seen what theologians have said. There's a couple of ways that we can understand what God was saying there in, let me back it up here, in that verse right there in 6.3. There's two ways we can understand that. Um, and, and the difference between the two understandings involves arguments about the original language. Uh, we need to remember that Hebrew is an ancient language. It was actually for a while a lost language. And, and being an ancient language, it does not have the most, it is not the most precise language. Let me just put it that way. And so either this verse means that... Uh, let me back up again. There we go. Whoops. There we go. Okay. Now I'll get it here. All right. I'm probably driving Kathy crazy up there right now. Where am I at, Kathy? Get me, get me, to, get me to that first one. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm in the dark. <laughs> All right. There we go. Oh, there we go. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Either that verse means that the spirit of the life of God that he breathed into mankind would not remain with him forever, and therefore his lifespan 
was only going to be 120 years, as opposed, if you look back in the previous chapters, you find out that man was living a very long time, long lives, hundreds of years. Uh, you can find that especially there in chapter 5. Uh, or it means that the Holy Spirit of God isn't going to remain with man forever and announces that he has, that mankind has 120 years to live until the flood wipes him out. So it's either one of those that that means. It's either that man is going to live beyond 120 years or in 120 years, God's going to wipe mankind out. And the more I study that verse, the more I lean to that last interpretation. I think that is the correct interpretation. And one of the reasons is, is that Genesis 11 tells us that after the, the flood, man lives, was still living well beyond 120 years. So what I do, I think that God is announcing that his patience is wearing thin, and in 120 years, mankind is going to be destroyed. I think the New Testament also bears that out. Uh, the Apostle Peter writes, God patiently waited in the days of Noah while an ark was being prepared. So we see the patience of God here while Noah is building the ark. So what's the picture here? It's a scene, scene where mankind is becoming increasingly wicked. And God is about to judge the whole world, but he chooses, he chooses to wait. He waits at least long enough for Noah to build this massive ark, and I believe the text tells us that he waited 120 years after he makes his first announcement of his displeasure. Now then, you might go, okay, that's good. Well, again, why the 120 years? Well, most scholars say, uh, from what we gather in the verses, that it took Moses between 100 and 120 years to build the ark. So God waited that 120 years. He knew how long it was going to take Noah to build that ark. And, and uh, so he waited. He chose. That's the key word. He chose to wait. Because God could have wiped out his creation like that with a blink of an eye. It could have all been gone. He could have, and, and folks, he would have been justified to do that. But he is patient with sinners. God is patient with sinners. He waits. And while he was waiting, Noah was building. And when everyone asked Noah uh, what he was uh, building this big boat for, he told them, judgment is coming. Judgment is coming. You need to get yourself right. 2 Peter 2.5 tells us that Noah was a preacher or a herald of righteousness. So while he's building, he's preaching Folks, get your lives right, get your lives right, get your lives right. Come on, get your lives right. And, and the reason why God delays judgment is that on a certain level, God wants everyone to be saved and not to be punished eternally. Now, I'm sure there were those there that were ridiculing Noah. <laughs> Noah, where's the flood? Where's the flood? Remember, it was going to rain. Right? Noah said it's going to rain. It never rained on the earth before. This is something new. Noah, it's going to rain. What's rain? You just made up that word, didn't you, Noah? You don't know what you're talking about, old man. You just, you just, you're light in the head, you know? I mean, they just probably making fun of it. You've been working on this ark for years, man. You're wasting all your time. Well, Jesus in Matthew 24 tells us that everyone was eating and drinking and marrying and giving their children in marriage until the very day that Noah entered the ark. Nobody listened to Noah. Evil was still rampant. But God was ever so patient with them. But they would have none of it. So the story of Noah isn't about God being cruel by wiping out all of life from existence. The story is how patient God is, even with those whom he's going to judge, because he wants them to change. He wants them to choose him. The next thing we see in this story is, well, let me get here. Okay. It reveals 
God's hatred for sin. It reveals God's hatred for sin. The reason that God's patience with sinners is so incredible is the fact that God absolutely despises, hates sin. The Bible here in verses 5 and 7 uh, that, that we read, it says, When the Lord saw the man's wickedness was widespread on earth and that every scheme his mind thought of was nothing but evil all the time, the Lord regretted that he had made man on earth and he was grieved in his heart. Then the Lord said, I will wipe off the face of the earth mankind whom I created together with the animals, the creatures that crawl, birds of the sky, for I regret that I made them. This tells us how displeased God is with what is going on, with what mankind was doing. He was so displeased, if you will, he was sorry that he created them. And he vowed that he was going to wipe man off the face of the earth. Now, what does God mean by that? God here really is not saying that if he had to do it over again, he'd never have created mankind. That's not what he's saying. What is being said here is a way of expressing how grieved God is over mankind's sin. Scripture is clear, folks. God is patient with sinners. But it's equally as clear that God hates sin. He hates it. In Psalm, for you are not a God who delights in wickedness. Evil cannot dwell with you. The boastful cannot stand in your presence. You hate all evildoers. You destroy those who tell lies. The Lord abhors a man of bloodshed and treachery. And the book, book of Proverbs tells us the same thing. It says, for the devious are detestable to the Lord. And in Ephesians, God's wrath is coming on the disobedient. So really, that word hate, that God hates sin, is really not that harsh of a word. God utterly despises any sin, any sin, from what we would consider the smallest of sins, a little white lie, to the largest of sins, a murder. God hates them all equally. We need to understand that equally. You know, sometimes when we say that we hate something, we simply avoid dealing with it. I dislike squash, and I avoid dealing with it. I don't eat it. We do that when things we hate. If we see somebody that we don't like in a place, a lot of times we won't go in that place because we want to avoid dealing with them. Well, here's something we need to understand. God didn't like that. God's hatred results in action. God's hatred results in action, which leads us to our third truth about God, and that's this. The account of Noah reveals God's holiness in judgment. It reveals God's holiness in judgment. God hates sin. So what does he do about it? He punishes it. He punishes sin. His holiness demands that he punish sin. I mean, let, let's kind of go to a very familiar part of the story. You know, God comes to Noah and uh, tells Noah what he's going to do and that he's going to flood the earth and he's going to kill everything on the land. And he instructs Noah to build the ark. And, and this ark that he built is massive. It's massive. Now, I haven't been to Kentucky to see the one that was, that was built there that's supposedly an exact replica of the ark that Noah built. But all I know what Scripture tells me is that it was about a 450 feet long. That's a football field and a half, right? Uh, 75 feet wide and 45 feet high. That's a big boat. That'd take a big Evan route to scoot it across the water, right? And... and so inside the ark, it would have approximately, get this, 1.4 million cubic feet of space. That's a lot of space. 
So there's plenty of room for all different kinds of animals that God instructs Noah to take with him. And, and the Bible tells us that Noah did as God commanded him, and that when the ark was finished, God instructed Noah to enter it with his family, and the Lord shut the door. Noah didn't shut the door. God shut the door to make sure that nothing else entered into that ark. And then judgment comes. And the waters come from rain, from, from fountains of the deep, if you will. And the ark is said to have floated high above the earth. Every creature perished. Those that crawl on the earth, birds, livestock, wildlife, and those that swarm on the earth as well as all mankind. Everything with the breath of the spirit of life in its nostrils. Everything on dry land died. He wiped out every living thing that was on the surface of the ground. From mankind to livestock to creatures that crawl. There we go. To the birds of the sky. They were wiped off the earth. Only Noah was left and those that were with him in the ark. Here's what we've learned so far. God's patient with sinners, but he hates sin. And so his patience does not last forever. His holiness demands he eventually judge sin by punishing the sinners. And this catastrophic flood is, is folks, it's a perfect example of his judgment. Now, some folks will read this story of Noah and they say, well, I don't want to serve or, or worship a God who, who would judge people in such a terrible way, in such an awful way. And that line of thinking there then extends to the subject of eternal punishment as well. And they say, well, the God I believe in wouldn't send anyone to hell. God, they want to see God as only a God of love and not also a God of holiness. Well, we need to bring the biblical perspective in on this. Do we really want to serve a God who does not judge people? Folks, he'd be a wimpy, unjust pushover. Who wants to worship a God who lets sin run rampant? And there's no accountability whatsoever. I don't know about you, but I don't want to serve a God like that. And that's not who God is. The God of the Bible is a holy God who executes justice perfectly. But that means we have a problem. Because in saying those words, I've just condemned myself. I deserve the wrath of the holy God that I appealed to. If I were alive in Noah's day, I, I would have deserved to have been swept away by those waters of judgment. But I'm so thankful that not only does the account of Noah reveal God's holiness in judgment, but it also reveals his graciousness in mercy. You see, we also see the account of Noah reveals God's graciousness in mercy. Even though most were judged, some were saved. Genesis 6, 8 says that Noah found favor with God. We're told that Noah was a righteous man. Now, this does not mean that he was sinless. Noah had his issues. Noah had his problems. He was not sinless. But what it means is that he always desired to the best of his ability to do God's will. And God saved him along with his family. And so, as you think about it, as you look at it, it's really not hard to see how God, God saving Noah is a foreshadowing of his saving believers in Jesus Christ. The book of Hebrews says this, by faith, Noah, after he was warned about what was not yet seen and motivated by godly fear, built an ark to deliver his family. By faith, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. You see, Noah is a perfect picture of salvation from sin. He believed God, and God saved him from judgment. Too often we think that the account of the... When we think of uh, 
Noah and the ark and that, we think of the judgment of God. And no doubt there was judgment. People died. Animals died. Creatures died. There was judgment. But let's not forget, Noah and the ark is also the story of mercy. It's a gospel story. God was disappointed with mankind. He was so disappointed that it's amazing that he saved anyone. But you know what, folks? The same is true with the cross. It's amazing that God chose to save any of us. You see, the account of Noah reveals God's graciousness in mercy. And then it reveals God's covenant-keeping faithfulness. God's covenant-keeping faithfulness. After the flood is over, Noah and his family exit the ark, right? It's down. God opens the door. They're able to come out. And then God makes him a promise. Now, in your Bibles, turn. I told you not to close them. To Genesis chapter 9. We're going to be reading verses 8 through 17. Genesis chapter 9. Verses 8 through 17. Verses 8 through 17 of Genesis chapter 9. Then God said to Noah and his sons with him, Understand that I am confirming my covenant with you and your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you, Birds, livestock, and all wildlife of the earth that are with you, all the animals of the earth that came out of the ark, I confirm my covenant with you that never again will every creature be wiped out by the waters of a flood. There will never again be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the sign of my covenant. I am making between. Uh, I am making between me and you and every living creature with you a covenant for all future generations. I have placed my bow in the clouds, and it will be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Whenever I form clouds over the earth and the bow appears in the clouds, I will remember my covenant between me and you and all the living creatures. Water will never again become a flood uh, to destroy every creature." The bow will be in the clouds, and I will look at it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and all the living creatures on earth. God said to Noah, This is the sign of the covenant that I have confirmed between me and every creature on the earth. That bow is what? The rainbow. That is to remind us of God's covenant that he made with Noah. That's called the uh, Noahic Covenant. And, and it's a covenant that, that God made with Noah and every living creature that was on that ark and every living creature that would come afterwards, and that's us, that God would never again destroy the world by flood. And he's kept that promise. The world has never been destroyed by flood since then. That rainbow is a sign, a visible sign of that promise. Not only does it remind us of God's promise, as he said, it reminds him also of that promise. He has kept that promise to this very day. And folks, this is why that is so important. If he keeps his promise to Noah, then he'll also keep the promises that he's made to you and me. God is faithful in keeping his covenant, his promises. God is faithful in that. That's the story of Noah. God is faithful to keep his promises. That's why if you've, ex if you've prayed to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you never have to worry. God said, if you'll pray it, if you'll mean it, if you accept my son as your Savior, I make you the promise, you don't have to worry about hell again. I don't care where you mess up. You don't have to worry about it. God keeps his promises. I can, pro I can tell you this. If you read the rest of the story of Noah, Noah messed up after he got off the ark. But you know what? God didn't destroy. God kept his promise. God kept his promise. 
And let me close with one other thought. Noah's God is your God. Noah's God is my God. Noah's God is our God. Noah's God is everyone's God because he is the one true God. But how are people going to experience God? Some are going to experience Him as the God who judged the world with a flood. And some are going to experience Him as the God who saved a family with an ark. So the question is, how do we apply the story of Noah and the ark to our lives? How do we apply that? How do you apply it if you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Well, you apply it this way. God is being patient with you. He's giving you an opportunity to repent from your sins. But here's the thing, folks. Don't test His patience. Because as we've seen in this story, God will judge sin. Accept his offer of forgiveness while you still have a chance to do so. Because that day that you stand before him in that great white throne, you don't have another chance. You don't have another chance the day you stop breathing on this earth. You only have a chance while you're here. Those people, every one of them, I can only imagine as the rain came down and the flood waters came up and they're banging on the ark, Noah, let us in. We'll believe now. We'll believe now. We'll believe now. It was too late, folks. They had 120 years. But they didn't. They refused. They didn't believe God was going to do it until it it happened. I find that's why some people don't accept Christ as their Savior. They don't believe God will judge them to hell. Everybody in hell will tell you differently. Oh, yeah, he will. Repent while you have the chance. God is being patient with you if you've not accepted Christ as your Savior. Don't test His patience. Because as I was talking with, uh, I was talking with Woody uh, this morning uh, before church and the fact that none of us know how long our life on this earth is going to be. From the moment you're conceived, the clock starts ticking down. And you don't know when it's going to hit zero. Only God does. For some, it's just maybe a day or two. For others, it could be 100, 105, or anywhere in between. But we don't know. Please, don't test God's patience. And if you're a believer, you have the comfort of knowing that just as God brought Noah and his family safely through the flood and saved them from that watery judgment, He'll bring you through this life safely into the next and save you from his eternal judgment. So the, really the story of Noah, we say Noah and the ark and we focus on the ark, but Noah, it's really not about an ark. The story of Noah and, and the ark is really not about the floodwaters and the, and the ark that floated up on, the, uh, on it or, the mount, or that floated on or the mountain that it came to rest on. That's really not what the story is all about. The story of Noah is about God who in His holiness and justice punishes sin, but it also reveals Himself to be gracious and merciful. It's about a saving God who delights in all who would believe in Him. That's what Noah is all about. So today, If you've never accepted Christ as your Savior, I'm going to ask you, would everybody just bow your heads in prayer? If you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, I hope you see how patient God is with you. But know that His patience will end at some point in time. Today, would you pray, Lord, I'm a sinner. You know it and I know it. And dear Lord, I'm asking you today to forgive me of those sins. And I'm asking you to come into my heart 
Today, I'm accepting you, dear Jesus, as my Lord and Savior, as my boss. And to the best of my ability, I am going to live for you. And I'm going to trust you for my eternity. Now, if you prayed that prayer and you really meant it, because if you just said the words and didn't mean it, then it, they don't, it won't do anything at all for you. But if you really meant it, you didn't have to get all those words, but if you meant the spirit of that prayer, then I promise you, according to God's word, you were saved. You're safe in the ark of Jesus Christ. You don't have to worry about judgment to come. And we invite you during our invitation here in just a moment, just step out into the aisle and come forward and just say, hey, preacher, I prayed that prayer. Why? Because we will celebrate with you. I mean, we're family. We're family here. You've just joined God's family. We will celebrate and, and, and rejoice as a new family member. But there's another reason, too. God's Word says that if you're ashamed uh, of Him before man, that He's not going to acknowledge you in heaven. You see, there's no such thing as a secret Christian. You either are or you're not. You either live for Him uh, or, or you don't. And so this is your step forward to acknowledge before man that Jesus is your Lord and Savior. So we invite you during this invitation time to come. Uh, maybe you're here today a, and a believer, and uh, you realize, man, you haven't been living the way you need to live. You're not, living, you're not living as if you are saved. Maybe you need to come and recommit your life to the Lord and, and give Him thanks that you are safe in His ark. Even though you've messed up, you're still safe. And you're going to be in heaven with him. You may want to pray. Maybe you're here today and, and you're hunting for a church home and, and God's put on your heart, this is the place he would have you to be. If God's bringing you here, all I know is this. You have gifts and talents we need to help make us a better church. And I pray as a church would help make you a better believer. So if the Lord's put that on your heart, we invite you also during this invitation time to come. All I know is this, is whatever God has laid on your heart during this time, please do it for Him. Don't say no. I mean, because he will, His patience only goes for so long. And then judgment. So don't wait. Don't test His patience. Don't wait. Father God, thank you for the story of Noah. And now, Lord, I just uh, ask that your Holy Spirit would come and that, Father, he would fall upon this place and that he would speak to our hearts. And, Father, that he, any decision that you would have us to make, that, Father, he would put it on our hearts and that, Father, we would do as you're calling us to do. For, Father, when you ask us to call us to do something and we don't and we refuse, that's called sin. And, Father, you're patient for so long, but as we saw with Noah, but after a while, the patience is over and judgment comes. And we pay the price for sin. So Lord, I just pray that uh, our hearts would be open to what you're having to say to us. This is your invitation to us to do as you've called us to do. May we do so, Father. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. From the media team at First Baptist Church of Troy, Texas, we want to say thank you for joining us today. If you have additional questions or want to know how you can experience the love of Christ in your life and family, visit us online at fbctroytx.org and send us a message. Thank you and have a wonderful week.